on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. The act of hunting, it was humanity's original spiritual practice. Hunting, plant medicine, ceremony, the Venn diagram of those things where they overlap, it's like something really magical there. Animals that are wild bring out our own wildness. And sometimes that is not all that acceptable in common, polite society. We live in all these different environments, the anthropogenic built environment, this increasingly digital space, and then the natural environment's the one that's hardest for people to be fit for today. Men who otherwise don't have a spiritual practice feel completely at home with hunting being a spiritual practice. You got two brain hemispheres for two perspectives. I want one that's esoteric and I want one that's rational. An animal will offer itself to the hunter if the hunter agrees to protect protect that species. Episode 135 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Hunting, Ritual, and Rites of Passage with Monsel Denton is brought to you by Sir Thrival. You've got to try the new naturally flavored colostrum from Sir Thrival. Chocolate with real cacao, vanilla with real vanilla extract, strawberry with real strawberry juice. I've been using colostrum daily and promoting it as a powerful nutritional supplement for over 15 years. In fact, I just had a quarter cup in my blended drink this morning and again this afternoon. With its ability to fortify your immune system, nourish and rebuild your gut lining, repair injuries, aid in muscle growth and recovery, and so much more, I think it's one of the most sophisticated food-based supplements we can include in our diet. Sir Thrival is already known as the number one source for premium colostrum, and now they've just released three new formulas, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. They're lightly sweetened with monk fruit and combined with MCT oil to make them more soluble in water and in blended drinks, all while having the same potency as Sir Thrival's original colostrum. They're so good, I keep eating them by the spoonful right out of the tub. Eaten like that, they're like a powdered ice cream, but of course, they make excellent blended drinks too. Again, these aren't those over-the-top fake flavors you taste in so many supplements today. These are flavored with real cacao, vanilla, and strawberry, so they taste great and really clean too. Go to surthrival.com to see the entire lineup of health-promoting supplements and superfoods and use the coupon code WILDFED for 5% off your order. Sir Thrival, why just survive when you could thrive? I'm proud to announce that we've recently started filming for season three of Wild Fed on the Outdoor Channel, which should start airing beginning of 2023. But until then, season two of Wild Fed is now on the air. From the 17-year periodical cicadas of Brood 10 to giant Atlantic bluefin tuna to the bison of Standing Rock's Great Plains, season two of Wild Fed is filled with unique hunts, forages, and incredible wild harvested meals and no shortage of adventure. Watch Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Eastern and again at 10.30 p.m. on Outdoor Channel. Hey, if you don't have cable, you can still watch the show live as it airs on FriendlyTV.com. That's spelled friendly without vowels, F-R-N-D-L-Y TV.com. You can get a free trial subscription if you want to watch season two, and after that, it's just $6.99 per month. Here at WildFed, we're so proud to have a second season on the air, and we really hope you'll tune in either on Outdoor Channel or FriendlyTV.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The WildFed Podcast a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Before I get to today's show, I want to give a shout out to Tom, the law enforcement officer at the CrossFit Box my wife Avani's been going to. Hey Tom, thank you for what you do and for keeping an eye out for my wife's safety. I'm a security-minded individual, so when Avani said she wanted to start going to CrossFit, the idea of her being 45 minutes away and exiting at night into a large, dark parking lot had me a bit apprehensive. Of course, I really trust Avani's situational awareness and physical competency, but anyone who's ever watched watched the active self-protection channel on YouTube knows how quickly things can go sideways. So when she told me Tom is there and that he's not just an LEO, but also a hunter and regular listener to the show, I started resting much easier. Tom, knowing you and some of your colleagues are there means the world to me. Thanks for listening to the show and for looking after my favorite person. You stay safe out there while you're shining light into dark places. And that brings me to today's show. My guest here for his second appearance is Monsel Denton. 
Monsell's a very unique voice in today's hunting culture, working at the intersection of transcultural ceremonial shamanism and hunting, seamlessly blending the two into a program and a brand he calls sacred hunting. Of course, it's not that other hunting isn't sacred, but rather that often this ancient and fundamentally human part of the hunt is forgotten by our modern culture in favor of more gear, tech, or trophies. And that works for a lot of people, so I don't say it to take away from the pursuits of others. Rather, I say it to highlight the need many folks feel for a more connected and holistic approach to the hunt, the land, and the animals we harvest. I believe that history will record this decade as a pivotal transitional moment in the way humans relate to the land, ecology, and the species we cohabitate with. I suspect for hunting to have a secure place in our future, we'll need to fundamentally reorder the way we approach it, since many folks today and probably many more tomorrow will struggle to understand hunting culture as it exists right now. We need to be sure that hunting isn't legislated away like some relic of the past, but instead remains a living tradition with a secure place in our new, increasingly complex society. This show has been a small part of a greater shift back towards a more food-centric view of hunting, and of course, in bringing a more holistic ecological perspective too. Monsell's work goes a bit further, reimagining our modern spiritual relationship to the hunt and the animals we pursue. This spiritual approach was, throughout most of human history, inextricable from the hunt itself, which means that today's more secular approach is kind of a radical new experiment in some regards. And I think that's left many would-be hunters feeling alienated from this really foundational human pursuit. So while Monsell's approach to hunting might not be for everyone, I think it's a crucial slice of the pie chart that is modern hunting. It's certainly recruiting, retaining, and reactivating certain individuals who've become jaded towards what they perceive as a spiritless hunt. And many of us, even if we don't choose to express it so openly, know deep down, hunting isn't just a physical experience. It truly is an expression of the spirit. Monsell Denton, welcome to the show. Hey, Daniel. Thank you again for having me back. Yeah, man, it's great to have you back. I think uh, a lot of our listeners have uh, heard your past show and probably heard me uh, advertising for your sacred hunting program, but um, love to just give folks a sense of uh, who you are, what you do, and in particular, maybe talk a little bit about uh, what sacred hunting is, because um, I think that's kind of foundational to uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, so the way I look at sacred hunting, despite the name, is it is the the rite of passage or the the transformation that I would have wanted as a young boy into manhood. And that encompasses many things. For me in particular, I see it as an opportunity specifically for uh, men to connect with one another, uh, connect uh, deeply with nature, but also with other men, seeing other men, uh, be, uh, seeing other men and being seen by other men. And, and then also, you know, the transformation that, as you know, comes from the process of taking the life of an animal, especially a mammal that looks and behaves much like us. And I also use, uh, plant medicine to, uh, provide, a, a deeper connection to our emotions and and really viscerally feel uh, some of the, the things that come up when we kill an animal. And so it's meant to be an embodied practice that facilitates learning and transformation for those participants who come. And although I do focus on men, I have had some amazing experiences with women and co-ed experiences as well. Yeah, it kind of occurs to me listening to you say that, that there's like the two components there because, you know, hunting is this, you know, that's, that's one aspect, but then there's also, um, this rite of passage piece and obviously hunting can be a rite of passage, but also sometimes it's not for people. And, uh, so I like how you're tying those two things together. Um, you know, I just, um, brought my wife out for her first hunt. That was our podcast. Uh, just recently we put out one together and, uh, and filmed her hunt as well, which was pretty wild, but um, really awesome to see somebody that I'm that close to go through their first hunt and what a transformational experience it is. Um, but then to really approach it uh, from the way you are having like the opportunity to really optimize all of the 
rite of passage aspects of it. That's really, really cool. What are some of the kind of experiences that, that people have coming through those programs? Yeah, so many experiences and partly, you know, my role as the facilitator or, uh, you know, as many of my friends like to call me a shaman, but that role is really to set the the context for the the individuals to go through uh, their own experience and whatever comes up for them is really what I desire to to bring forth and to lay the seeds, create the fertile ground for them to have their own realizations. And many of those realizations have not much to do with, you know, the act of hunting in and of itself. Um, there are, you know, people who have, I remember, you know, one of the things that I talk about is death medicine as being, uh, uh, using the death of an animal as a gateway or a portal to open up our relationship to death more broadly. And I've had men who lost a child, a very young child who have, you know, grieved the loss of their child by seeing uh, the loss of, uh, of an animal child. And I've had people who have decided they wanted to leave, you know, intimate relationships because they felt finally embodied in a sense of masculinity. I've had people who have left their professional life because they've realized that it was no longer serving them in the way that a connection to nature provides them. So, you know, there there are these turning point moments that everybody goes through in life and these moments can be after leaving high school or college or after, uh, you know, breaking up with a significant other, um, transitions from, from professional life. So there's, there's so many of these opportunities and this experience, it gives them a lens to see things from, uh, a very ancestral way that is sometimes, you know, completely different than their day-to-day life. And one example from the past weekend, I just facilitated a group a couple days ago, uh, a woman, she was wrestling with the possible divorce that she, you know, needed to commit to. And during the experience uh, of sacred hunting, she had a lot of things come up around her sexuality and her relationship to her partner and her son and other men. And, you know, none of those things were directly related to what we were experiencing on the sacred hunting uh, trip. But my desire was to use them and use nature as a guide for her to go through that process. Wow. You know, there's this, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this idea. It's called, they call it terror management theory. I don't, I'm not in love with the name, but, um, I think it all comes out of, if I understand it back in uh, the seventies, early seventies, this anthropologist, Ernest Becker wrote a book called the denial of death. And, the, you know, he, and then I think subsequently, uh, folks who were following his line of research, um, developed this idea of terror management theory. But what they were looking at was um, how much humans suppress their fear of death and how sort of like underlying everything for us is this fear of mortality. And then that driving so much of what human behavior actually, you know, the manifestations of human behavior, ultimately, like so many of them can be traced back to this fear we have of death. And one of the things about it that I, I don't love is just, I think a lot of that fear of death is a a lot of that is primal, but a lot of it is modern. And um, I think we've been living so isolated from seeing death on the day to day. I mean, you think about how frequently you would have seen it even up until, geez, I don't know, 75 years ago, 50 years ago, not not that long ago. Um, the other day, kind of right uh, contemporaneously with the turkey hunt I brought my wife on, um, we had a litter of puppies here. So our dog, uh, we bred her um, I guess eight weeks ago and, um, she birthed ultimately 10 puppies, but three were born, stillborn, two died after birth, you know? 
And it was this really powerful experience going through it. And we just kept thinking, man, this would be so normal to experience. Um, but today it's infrequent that you see it. Um, or uh, another example would be um, a friend of ours who did an assisted suicide in Canada. We got to be present for that. Um, it's just like something that you know typically see um, in our society. It's like rare to watch somebody die. And so I think people n- sort of accidentally nurture this, this fear of death. And hunting is this incredible way to get out in front of that and look at it. And I think it's also interesting, like I guess what I hear you alluding to is sometimes the death – that we're wrestling with isn't necessarily the physical death of something, but it could be the, the transformational moment or a change in something like you brought up relationships or jobs or things like that. So it seems like hunting can be this, um, opportunity to come face to face with like deeply repressed fears about, you know, the end of things. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And, I remember when I went through my rite of passage with this and, you know, to back up my journey creating sacred hunting experiences was really nothing more than me stumbling on what I had used intuitively to help me grow and learn and and transform myself. And so or the denial of death book actually played a really big role in my my development. Oh, no I read it. Oh, cool. Yeah, I read it a, a month after I hunted for the first time, and I remember just very deeply meditating, using ayahuasca, using just you know my mental energy and attention on you know what what death uh, meant for me coming from this first uh, experience of killing an animal. And, you know, as that translates to people today, I think there's, there's almost a, a yearning for a connection to death because of what it creates for our sense of living. You know, our ancestors, I do agree with you, there was a certain fear associated with death in terms of just in the moment maintaining their physical safety but in many ways death was also revered if you consider many of the the north american indigenous tribes to die in battle to die quote unquote a good death was better than you know to die of old age and so there's there's in that there's a seed of what I imagine many modern people feel, which is how do I live the life that I have fully? And death can provide a mirror for people, as you said, to look at their own relationship to the life that they're leading and assessing, does this feel like the most authentic expression of me? Does this feel like the the way that I want to spend my finite time on this planet. I like that term that sometimes uh, folks use um, when they're talking about personal transformation and the idea of dead wood. And like, sometimes you have to burn off the dead wood, you know, like you think about like pruning an apple tree or something like that. And if you want it to be really productive, it's like, sometimes you got to not just prune it, but actually like remove dead wood. And I think like a lot of that stuff accumulates on us and we need to go through these, like deep transformational experiences and sometimes get right down to the core of what's really there too. So, um, you know, what you're talking about hunting plant medicine ceremony, the, the, I guess the overlap, the Venn diagram of those things where they overlap is like something really magical there. Um, right now I'm reading a really fascinating book. I don't know if you've seen this one. It's called, uh, how God, I think it's how, how God changes your brain breakthrough findings from leading neuroscientists. Um, so it's a neuroscience book. It's not a, not a religious book, but it's looking at the effect of prayer, largely meditation, uh, meditation, prayer, and kind of ritual on your brain from a neuroscience perspective. And, uh, man, it's a really powerful read because first of all, it gives you a lot of compassion for what other people believe or don't believe. Um, and this understanding that our, how we perceive the divine is, uh, deeply personal from a, from a neurological perspective. But the ultimate kind of takeaway from it is that we really need, um, like you're a lot healthier of a person 
if you have spiritual practices. And in particular, like ritual is one of these powerful ways that we can um, access some of that, those benefits. And again, like we were just talking about, all that stuff's been really stripped away from our culture in, you know, through the modern kind of scientific paradigm. And the there's this, not only do we not see death, but then when we do, it's not often, in my opinion, properly ritualized so that it leaves kind of this weird void for us too. So it's like we rarely see death. That makes us afraid of death. It's sort of like if you lived in a completely padded environment all the time and then you get out into an environment that's not padded and you might feel like nervous and might hit every corner. You know, it's like if you never see death, it almost makes it worse. And then, uh, and then when you don't have the ritual component, because like another thing I, I've seen kind of transculturally around the world is this idea when you die, you go to be with all those people who've died. So you get to go be with all your ancestors. It's, it's like something really beautiful in that. So anyway, I feel like now we're sort of left afloat without any real direction or understanding of like where we are in the place of things. And so, yeah, I think these things we're talking about give us anchor points that can be so important. And if you don't go out and find a way to have those things, like society's not going to hand them to you, right? They're not, they're not really like easy to access unless you decide you really want them. Yeah. And that is in many ways, that is a big part of my role in sacred hunting is to not only create the opportunity for people, but give them permission and, you know, a lot of the reason why I give them permission is just simply because of the way that I lead my life. And I've been very blessed. We may have talked about it in the first podcast, but I have, you know, worked with a spiritual teacher for nine years who he believe he is an eco spiritual teacher and he brings animism through indigenous cultures into his life, into his you know, practice. And he has taught me that. And so given that I didn't grow up with any, you know, religious background, I legitimately see the world through this ceremonial animist lens. And I look to animals, I look to nature to provide me with guidance. And in that there's a certain level of ceremony and ritual that comes with it. And so as I simply lean into embodying all those practices. And sometimes it's not always easy because I do feel in ways like the odd person that has, you know, animal parts all over my body that I'm adorning myself with, <laughs> but that <laughs> a handful of necklaces to say exactly, the least. <laughs> but that is allowing people to have permission to tap into the same thing that's sort of innate in all of us because somewhere down all of our lineage we were deeply connected to the land indigenous just means of the land and whether that was of the land in europe celtic and other tribes before you know civilization took over in europe or in north america south america wherever it is um, there is that in all of us, I believe. Yeah. I, I sometimes struggle with the term because, um, like there's this clear, distinct thing, you know, here in North America, it's, it's obvious. And of course, like I say, this with such full respect for the history here and the, the trauma, cultural trauma and generational trauma that's taken place and all those things. But I guess um, it's it can be hard sometimes. It's like, well, that person's indigenous. You're not indigenous. Like, well, if I'm not indigenous, like, am I an alien? Like, where where am I? Where am I from? Like, I was born on Earth, you know. Like, I that it leaves a lot of us as if we are. Um, what would be the word? Like, some kind of. Oh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of how to say it, but like, as, as if we came out of factories or something. Like, we're we're not made of the earth, too. Uh, so I understand, of course, like when someone says they're indigenous, what they mean, and I have so much respect for for that and and what that has come to mean culturally. But it does sort of make it seem like everybody else doesn't belong uh, on earth, and that kind of isolate. Like the the neuroscience is clear. Like isolation is one of the most toxic things that you can experience. Uh, and that's been well understood for so long. I mean, you look at how it's utilized in prisons as an example, um, even for the hardest, like 
most, you know, emotionally suppressed people on the planet, it's so hard to be isolated. So, you know, when you feel isolated from the planet itself, like you're, you're not part of it, you didn't come from it. That's a little bit scary to me. And then what kind of, what does that create? Like what kind of mindset does that create and what kind of exploitation does it lead to? So it seems like it's really, really important. And, and then when you bring up the thing about animals, it's sort of like, you know, to me, you animals are these other non-human, you know, persons on the planet that if we don't have a relationship with them, then we're isolated again. Now, maybe not just isolated as individuals, but now we're isolated from a species perspective. And that's also seems really, really toxic. And the, you look at the byproduct of that, like people who feel like they're, <laughs> the planet just belongs to people you know, that mentality. I think that comes from like, when you connect people with animals through the hunt, you know, you could imagine somebody thinking, well, that's terrible. You're just teaching them to kill. It's like, whoa, take a bigger view. You're actually connecting them back to non-human persons who also share the planet with them. So have you found that um, by doing that, like people's perception of their place in the world shifts in a positive way because they now have touch points for other other creatures and in, in their lives too. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the practices that I have people utilize right at the beginning of a sacred hunting experience is to imagine the animal that they will be hunting and to write a love letter to that animal and to name that animal. And the purpose is really to start this process of creating connection, connection and bonds that, that are between human and animal that are not often considered to be valuable. They're not uh, often accepted. And, you know, definitely in the hunting world, it's just not that common for people to, to make that connection. And I think when, you know, one of the core uh, processes of dehumanization is by stripping people of their names, of their individuality, and just seeing them as an other, right? So in a sense of a war, you know, that's not, that's this is not their name, it's just they're a terrorist or they're an other that is an enemy. Um, and while there's not so much of that you know, creation of an enemy with animals, there is definitely a separation. There's no name. There's no, you know, there's no, not always, but there's usually no touch points that, that brings their uniqueness to life. And so that is one of my core objectives is for people to feel the full range of human emotions in one act and that is what is so uniquely uh, capable or, or possible through hunting. It is possible to feel uh, so much joy and pride and happiness and uh, you know desire to share and be in community with this animal and this meat and this uh, food that I've just provided. But at the same time, the sadness and the grief and the sometimes confusion and questioning that comes with the same act. And if we can, you know, really take that moment, that unique and beautiful moment of the full range of human experience, then there's so much to offer there. And that is part of, you know, that is part of having a deeper connection to that specific animal and then also all of the animals of of that species and and all of the you know the species that surround us and you know a lot of some of the indigenous myths of of the americas they come to terms with killing animals prey animals in in particular by saying that an animal will offer itself to the hunter if the hunter agrees to protect that species. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, uh, there's this old indigenous relationship to these animals that 
I am still, you know, finding myself and still going through practices myself in order to bring it to participants or, or listeners to the podcast more broadly. We'll get back to the show in a moment, but first, right now I'm wearing my new Wild Fed hoodie. We really took our time choosing these hoodie blanks before we had them printed. They've got a charcoal body and an olive green hood and sleeves, and they've got our Food is All Around You logo on the front with a really cool foraging basket, fishing rod, and suppressed rifle on the back with the text Hunt Forage Fish. These are super soft and comfortable, look great, and work well in the field or in town. I really love the thickness, too. They're fairly light and perfect for the spring days and summer nights ahead. Right now, they're 10% off with the coupon code HFF10 at wild-fed.com. Show your love for Wild Fed and the wild food lifestyle. Head over to wild-fed.com and use the coupon code HFF10, that's shorthand for Hunt Forage Fish 10, for 10% off your new favorite hoodie. Now back to the show there's something about I, I often ask myself like why wild animals versus um you know we work with a farmer locally to us who raises hogs and chickens and beef and m- incredible food and in some ways i see advantages to the to that as food um you know in that you know where that you know you know that animal's not gotten to anything toxic you you know you know how long it's been alive you you know its history in a way that you can't with a wild animal so you know, I see some advantages there. So it's like, why do I, what is my interest in wild animals? And then I think about how a wild animal has true autonomy in the world and um, how powerful that idea is because it's like, if you have cattle, it's considered property and even your dog, like this is a hard one. I kind of wrestle with this too, thinking about it as like a, somebody who just loves dogs. And, um, you know, if somebody shoots your dog and kills it, it's not murder. It's the destruction of property. So I think the exception to that would be like a police dog. I think they consider that a homicide, but, but otherwise, um, yeah, I mean, you know, if, if, a if confronted by a dog and, you know, you decided to, let's say, shoot a dog, I mean, that, you know, you've destroyed someone's property, but not necessarily, you're not a murderer by, by in the eyes of the law. Um, and so I think we have this like long-term relationship with the animals we've domesticated, they, that ultimately they're like property for us. And then wild animals, it's so different. These animals have the same kind of like free will and autonomy that you and I have, or pro- you know, honestly a lot more. Um, and so there's something about that to me that makes that relationship more powerful when you have it, because it's not the relationship you have with domestic animals is like on your own terms, but the d- relationship you have with wild animals, like that's kind of on their terms, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that is a unique yeah, it's a unique distinction the the difference between the two and I think what you've touched on this, you know, on our terms domesticated animals being something that we've manipulated for our purposes and that doesn't necessarily that doesn't mean we can't love them, we can't protect them. In fact, most people have an even closer emotional relationship. I would argue that you know people who don't hunt have a relationship with their dogs that gives them some some uh, you know relationship to to animals that that can be a bridge. But animals that are wild, they bring out our own wildness and mm-hmm. remind us of things about ourselves that are often suppressed. And sometimes that is not all that acceptable in common polite society. You know, I have, <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> wild animals in a lot of ways, yeah. you know, the wild is by human assessment it can be brutal and it can be uh dark in our you know in our perspective it it in nature it it just is and there's a beauty to all of it but it can really bring out in us the wildness that exists and i've had to wrestle with it because i have so fully immersed myself in this predator prey relationship with animals that i notice how it sometimes comes up in social situations with people and is 
not always welcomed and <laughs> it is yeah it's just a part of managing you know our own sense of of wildness and domestication and we humans who uh, are still on the grid and recording podcasts and listening to podcasts we're we're somewhere on the domesticated spectrum uh and you know my hope is to 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 move to more towards the the wild uh, undomesticated uh feral if you will um human uh, and you know that's a process yeah i often think of it like and i and i say it on the show a lot that we just we live in all these different environments and one is the one's the anthropogenic built environment you know one is this increasingly digital space that now is starting to take you know essentially what will be experientially for us like three dimensional form as an actual place which is pretty wild and then you know there's the natural environment and and you meet individuals who are fit for one but not the others and you know f- seems to me that the biological imperative for all species is to thrive in your environment and here we find ourselves in these three different environments it seems like we need to be fit for them and so I think the natural environment's the one that's hardest for people to be fit for today, you know, especially because it's so much, like you said, there's this perception of its brutality and its harshness. I mean, there's initially on a nice summer day, like outside today, it's like puffy white clouds, blue skies, it's like 70 degrees, everything's starting to fill in with green now that it's spring, it's so beautiful out. And if you go for a walk today, you're not like, oh, nature's brutal. (laughs) It feels like nature's lovely, but it's like, we'll stay out there for three or four days and don't come in. And then, and then you'll start to see some other sides too, uh, you know, hang out there long enough and you see some pretty wild things happen. So I think that uh, it's a lot easier for people to be in the built environment than, and you see the ease with which people want to transition to the meta spaces that are being created now. So um, I think what you're doing, what I'm trying to do as well is just like help acclimate people or be like a, you, you said, like be a bridge for people to the place where they actually come from. It seems like so foolhardy to try to leave that behind so suddenly. But um, yeah, you know, when I'm around my dog, I'm all, who's a good girl? Who's a good girl? (laughs) Then When I'm around a prey animal and I'm hunting, man, I'm a whole other beast. It's like, and it it all happens naturally. Like when I took Avani hunting, you know, she was asking me like, well, what do I do when I see the turkey? Like, what am I going to do when this happens? And it's like, you're going to know what to do because it's already in you. So I love watching. I'm sure you see this all the time. And I wonder too, I guess a side question I want to go back to after is like, does this ever not happen? And do you see people who just don't have it in them anymore? But, but I notice most people instinctively crouch three, four inches lower. They, you know, kind of hunch shoulders forward, eyes go far out piercing, they start scanning the environment, like all these things that they hear a sound, they freeze, like all the things that, that you do as a hunter, you don't, it's not like somebody teaches you that you, you learn that you, you learn that from your own nervous system. It is already pre-programmed. So, uh, yeah, I wonder, do you concur with that? And then also, do you meet people where you're like, oh, this person just, maybe they're, (laughs) it's like, you know, I often joke about chihuahuas. So it's like, you know, is a, is a chihuahua too domesticated to to do certain wolfy things anymore? Do you ever encounter people where you're like, man, that person's just never going to be able to hunt? I have never experienced someone who I I judge was never going to be able to hunt. I have had actually the That's most awesome, recent. Man. That's really cool to hear. <laughs> yeah, I've had the most recent hunt where people have definitely chosen to not participate and Mm -hmm. sometimes people who have chosen to not participate at certain times you know the ceremony process where they get really connected to their feelings and their emotions can sometimes bring up enough where they decide they're done and they're not going to continue the hunt They they feel like they got what they came for and they don't need to continue you know wielding a weapon in order to to grow and to learn at least in that experience. And so there's definitely people who decide, you know, at least for that weekend that taking the life of an animal is not for them and they are fully willing and capable of participating in someone else taking the life of an animal and helping and supporting. 
but they just, for whatever reason, decide, you know, right now is, is not the time for me. And I really honor that and really encourage people to listen to whatever comes up because these, the, 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 in, the purpose for me is to, is to bring up whatever is in them to bring forth what is yeah. within them. Yeah. And that has, that cannot have an agenda from me. So I don't want people to participate necessarily or not want them to. It's, it's simply about giving them the opportunity to fulfill what is within them. And, but to your point, I do see, especially with men, so many just feel completely at ease and they've never done it before. And they just feel like not only is it a fit for them to go through the motions of hunting and, you know, the, the practical side of taking the life of an animal. But what I've found really compelling uh, is men who otherwise don't necessarily have a spiritual practice who feel completely at home with hunting being a spiritual practice. And wow. yeah. that is unique because we live in a spiritually bereft society and to find a, a sense of connection and spirituality through something is so valuable and to have men who you know what for whatever reason they don't resonate as much with you know whatever eastern traditions or meditation or whatever the case is but hunting is just so relevant for them uh, at a at a deep like dna level that they're open to it being a spiritual practice especially because if it's their first time hunting and i'm guiding them then they have that context for for hunting and you know i like to say that and the the subtitle of my book is i'm rekindling a an ancient spiritual practice it was the it was humanity's original spiritual practice there's a great quote uh by i forget what his name is but he he basically says man's first religion was to kill god and eat him <laughs> wow wow Wow. Yeah. You know, um, I was talking a minute ago about that book, how God changes your brain. And, uh, they talk uh, at length about how their research has shown that what the practice is, uh, or what the religion is, as long as it's not a fundamentalist religion. So in other words, as long as it doesn't have a, it's not othering folks and it's not saying like these folks need to be destroyed or these folks are bad for their beliefs, but instead focusing on the um, higher aspects of spiritual practice. It doesn't matter what the tradition is or what the actual act is. It all kind of has the same effect, positive effect on your neurology. So uh, to me, that's so cool. Somebody who wouldn't necessarily embrace other types of um, you know, traditional or non-traditional religious practices or spiritual practices, but hunting can fill that role for them so that they still get those benefits and, and neurologically balancing, you know, impacts of a spiritual practice. And yet that's still this incredibly practical thing too. So I love how it can play kind of double duty as both of those things. And then I guess that third component being like what you're, you're hinting at here is just how ancient this is anyway. So you're doing something that your, your body and your mind already knows and probably craves too. Yeah, I do believe most people crave it. And there's a, yeah, most people crave the connection that comes from it. And it's so innate. It would be repetitive to, to go through all the myriad number of connection points that it offers for people. I often joke when someone says to me, you know, I've heard a lot that I'm I'm following my dharma. I'm following, you know, this this path that is unique and compelling to some people. And I joke that I have the most simple uh, recipe that there is. I'm just finding the most human basic things and trying to do them as much as possible. 
<laughs> yeah, which which looks so out of place today against this backdrop of such an unnatural way of life, you know. That's what's funny about it. I mean, the way we're living today, it's just it's almost like it's almost like if you took a, an animal and you were going to put it in the zoo and you were like, "Hey, what would be like the most destructive zoo habitat for this species?" Like, let's create that. <laughs> that would be like how most of us are living today. You know, cuz right down to such fundamental things like the idea that we poison our own food supply. <laughs> it's like, really? Like, and, and everybody's eating that food. Even the people who are doing the poisoning <laughs> eat that food or like, let's poison also our own water supply and let's poison our air supply. Hey, let's poison our minds too. <laughs> it's like really shocking how we're living today. So, you know, it's not surprising that there's this been this big call to return to some of the things that I often refer to it as, um, you know, it's the same advice you give to a person who's lost. So it's like, hey, if you ever get lost in the wilderness, it's like return to your last known point. <laughs> That's kind of like what I think we need to do as a species right now. And hunting is one of those things that, you know, I think that's why we see such a huge renewed interest in it right now. Yeah. By the way, what are you seeing? Like, what's what are you noticing um, from the unique perspective you have on it? Um, you know, f- for sure at Wild Fed, we just got picked up for our third season. We've, we're actually um, filming our second episode for season three right now. Um, that tells me that there's a big interest in this stuff. Food, uh, wild food in particular, foraging, hunting, fishing, all of it. There's like a huge resurgence in interest. Um, but what are you seeing? Because you got kind of like boots on the ground of people actually like coming to you to physically learn these kind of things. Um you know, I know it's a lot more than it encompasses what you do is a lot more than just hunting, but just kind of curious, like what you're seeing in people and, and, uh, do you think it's like a response to what's happening around us at the, you know, I guess, political level, economic level, spiritual level, physical, like all, all those levels. Yeah. There's so many different avenues for people to come to my experiences. And i have a pretty strong filter for at least being open to the spiritual uh, approach. So, you know, I definitely weed out people who are not at all interested in, in that, but I definitely have found so many people who reference the state of the world when they have a desire that uh, is compelling them to learn the practical skills of hunting and you know make no mistake about it we do spot and stock hunting and i have amazing guides and the practical skills are definitely a priority you know someone could spend their whole life hunting in a blind and they wouldn't learn you know what we what we teach in a weekend because we are making it a little bit harder on ourselves by spot and stock but you know back to some of the other reasons that people come, it's uh, a lack of connection to nature. Many people who are just in the cities and just feel super disconnected with the work that they're doing, the, you know, being plugged into the quote unquote matrix, the kind of cliche that people use, but it, it has a lot more resonance now as people, I believe, are starting to see that a lot of the systems, these systems that are poisoning us, these systems that are poisoning our minds and our bodies and uh, destroying the planet are collapsing. And people want to, even if they can't just quit their job, they want to experience or taste what a different way of being is, Mm -hmm. being in relationship to the earth. Uh, being in relationship with other people. You know, I take for granted that I've done men's work for, you know, nearly a decade now. And there are so many men that are starved for deep, intimate connection with other men or other women or even themselves and, and their own emotions. And so I, it's no wonder that these experiences are touching upon core basic needs at this time in our civilization for so many people because you know this this evolved from my own quest i felt all of those things i felt mm-hmm. disconnected from myself i felt disconnected from nature i felt so 
it felt so odd that I had never killed an animal, even though I was eating meat and finding so much health and vitality from it. So I really, I do believe that there's a resurgence to, to hunting from, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, having relative success in a very specific uh, way of of speaking about hunting, but I do think there's a resurgence. And what I also find is that the the language, the the voice, the the way in which hunting is portrayed matters so much to mm-hmm. so many people, mm-hmm. and when people see you know laughing and joking and trophies bloody trophies and and things like that it really puts a lot of people off and to you know kind of sound a little bit dramatic it it creates a feeling for many that hunting is not safe hunting is not emotionally safe and what i have stumbled upon because that's what I needed myself is a a way of speaking about hunting that resonates with people. And I can't tell you the number of people who have told me I have wanted to hunt for so long, but I didn't trust anybody to take me. I didn't trust that they would treat this with the reverence that it needs to be treated. And you know, most of the people who are living in the city, who who are who grow up in the city, who are, are desiring to return back to nature and return to a connection to their food, they have those sensitivities, and so that is where I think you and myself have very specific voices. And as we'll talk about, I have. You know, I'm working on a, a TV show that has my own voice that can speak to people in another way about this practice of hunting. Yeah, I'm glad you bring all that up. There's kind of a lot to unpack there. Um, and I, I often have folks, you know, like they'll DM me or they'll write the company and, and say, you know, to, to inquire whether I'm leading hunts or they can hire me as a guide or something. And, you know, it's just not something I'm doing right now. I'm a bit busy for that, but But, um, they ask me usually with the caveat that, cause I'll say, you know, I talk a lot about finding mentors and a lot of people are saying something similar to what you're saying. Like, I don't feel safe doing that. I don't trust the energy people are bringing to this. I don't trust that they're going to do it in a way that's going to feel good for me. And I, and I think I was the type of personality that was like, I can, it's, I, I can take that on. That doesn't scare me. I'll shed what doesn't fit for me and I'll use what does. And I, you know. Um, that worked for me, but a lot of people are like, Hey, I just can't be a part of something that feels, doesn't feel, I don't feel aligned with. And so like, I really respect that. And I I think that's going to be a big part of, and you know how the, the typical, the, the, how do you say it? It's like the stereotypical hunter that they're imagining would be like, come on, man, just man up and do it. (laughs) You know? And I don't think that's like really how most folks are, but but I can understand how someone might feel like that's what's out there. And so um, it's not what I've experienced, but I know where people would be coming from. So it's a challenging thing because, you know, how do those two worlds ever merge unless there's characters like yourself who are willing to be that bridge? Because, uh, yeah, you know, you got these very different personality types. And I think, too, uh, something I often point out uh, to to folks who like talk to me about the show or whatever is I, I'll, I think of my, I think of wild fed as, um, you know, I'm here, I'm more talking about the TV show is a show that maybe if you're somebody who hunts and fishes and forages, you know, and you have for a long time, like if you grew up hunting, you know, you might like the show. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Um, but I make it thinking like I'm making it for people who are new to it. Um, because I, I feel like I don't, I don't see myself as being the kind of, person that long-term hunters are looking at going like, well, I want to see what that Daniel Vitalis is doing. Like, I just don't picture that very much. You know, I think they have so many icons that represent them better. And those, those folks are doing such a great job of representing those folks. I'm just trying to be there for all the people kind of 
who are who are we're talking about who are going like hey i want to get involved in this but i need to come at it from a different perspective so i'm really trying to trying to do that and um i also just wanted to say uh, as far as like the you know you were talking kind of like when people see photos and it, it kind of feels like hey that's not really a safe thing that's one of the things that's so fascinating to me is you know when my wife came hunting and she got her turkey pretty fast she wanted to do those photos and we were talking about it the other day, podcasting. And I was like, isn't it interesting? Because you see those photos and they look like one thing. And then you get an animal and then you're like, whoa, I want those photos for some reason. <laughs> I guess I thought I wouldn't, but I do because you see it so differently. Now, oh, now I see why people are smiling in those pictures. Like now I see why they want to spread the tail fan out and show the bird. Like, of course, like it makes so much sense once I've done it. But before you've done it, you look at it and it's like, oh, that looks like you're gloating over, you know, having murdered something, you know, and I, I get it because I've been on both sides of that. So I find that fascinating, but I, I want to um, take some time to talk about, um, you know, feel free to comment on any of that, but I, I definitely love to hear about your project, what you're taking on and, um, you know, the idea of some other folks coming from these alternative perspectives into the hunting space, the hunting TV space is really exciting to me. Um, I think we're at a place right now where, uh, you know, it's not like there's not room for us all. There's like a lot of room right now. And uh, we have the opportunity to really change the space a little bit, at least bring another perspective. So I'm really excited about your project. So uh, I don't know what you can share about it, but I want to hear about it. Yeah, well, you know, I have found that being a facilitator of these experiences for people in person. These are groups that are six people at a time. I have very much had to, A, just grow in my leadership capacity, but also grow in my ability to follow the story that is presenting itself. And so many of these hunts they tell a story and there's themes and motifs and, 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 and they're all unique in their own way. And, you know, for example, I had one really amazing beginner immersion that I had where it was four medical doctors. It was the first time I'd had a medical doctor and it was four of them together. Hmm. And it was in you know, this COVID era where the entire society is gearing up around how do we protect against death by any means necessary, regardless of what we have to sacrifice. And these doctors, their experience was so unique because a couple of animals that we killed were actually animals that we found that were wounded. It was February, late winter. There was a baby that couldn't even stand up because she just didn't have the food in order to survive. And it's there was another one. Deer. This was an addicts. It was oh, a wow. yeah. And and then there was another one that had a, a a wounded knee. It was an older animal. And both of the kills were essentially mercy kills. Not not necessarily hunting in the standard uh finding a, a wild animal and then tracking it and 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 you know being at odds with you know what the the animal was was trying to do to survive but it was such a beautiful reminder for these doctors these medical doctors that death is not always bad and in this specific instance, the story was death can be merciful. Death can be in service. And so, you know, I have had enough of these experience now. I've facilitated for hundreds of people that I wanted to tell stories that were on my edge. Where am, you know, now I'm leading these experiences on a regular basis, but where am I still, you know, the teacher must still be pushing his edge to learn, right? Yeah, and, and too. right. And so part of 
that quest for me was following what was true for me, what was alive for me. And for uh, many years, what was alive for me was I wanted to go to Russia and I wanted to go to some of the most remote parts of the planet. And so it just so happened that my, uh, my trip to Russia and to Siberia just coincided with the start of the war and Russia invaded Ukraine about one week before I went there. Yeah. And, and I want to just uh, jump in and just say, I know a lot of the people listening to the show heard me advertising that trip that you were doing there because, you know, I kept talking about you were doing this trip to Siberia, you know, in the ads that I was running for your program. And, uh, when that happened, you know, it took a little while for it to like click for me. And then one day I was like, wait a second, like he's going there in 2022. Like, how's that going to work? Yeah. And there were participants who were scheduled to go and they dropped out because uh, for obvious reasons. And it was a really beautiful gift for me personally. And like I said, you know, I'm still working through and integrating what it means for me uh, on a personal level and with my work. But, you know, there's a really we can you know dive into some of the details there but there's a really great line Jane Goodall she she said when she when I went to Africa I was a biologist when I left the jungle I was an activist mm. and I feel as though for me when I came to nature I was a hunter and it was as a hunter that's how I related to nature and when I left Russia and had this amazing experience with these 700 pound cats that are the most gorgeous, breathtaking things on the planet, I came back an activist, a conservationist. And, you know, first and foremost, the show is just going to be entertaining. I'm going to Russia. There's so much uncertainty. I'm tracking these tigers and uh, spending time with indigenous tribes, the Udige in Russia. But ultimately... I'm finding that this show is is bringing a new level of of depth of spirituality of connection to not just nature but these animals that many people across the globe consider to be gods uh, and bringing that to you know Western audience. So we're talking about Siberian tigers, man. You sent me a couple photos that were like, I, do you remember my response? I said, "Is this a zoo?" <laughs> what, are, what are these pictures, you know, these beautiful tigers in the snow, man, it was hard to believe, but, um, you, what is Siberia even like? Well, Siberia is enormous. So it's like different things in different places. And where I went in far East Russia, it's actually the Siberian tiger is in Far East Russia, and it is called the Siberian tiger, but it is not actually part of Siberia. The Russian Far East is a very unique, very, very unique part of the world. It is what they call a boreal jungle, and what oh, that wow. means is... No way. Yeah. So during the winter, it just looks like Alaska. It's a boreal landscape, snow, deep snow. Uh, some evergreen trees, but lots of, you know, lots of um, tall standing trees. But then when spring and summer and fall come around, it becomes super lush and uh, really kind of the habitat that you would imagine a tiger would live in, you know, in, in uh, India or Indonesia or something like that. And so it's a really unique landscape. And I was there during the winter and it was very cold. You know, it got down to minus minus 10 to minus 20 degrees. But, you know, ironically, the fear of the tiger or the temperature was uh, very little of my actual concern while I was over there. <laughs> wow. And so any takeaways that you want to share? Or is this a little too, you know, private still to talk about? I know that... Uh... You know, obviously you don't want to reveal the whole story since it's going to be a TV show. Well, you know, a lot of it did have, a lot of it had to come, it did come down to fear and it did come down to, and I, you know, I went into this experience and it, one of the greatest gifts was 
and I think this is a gift for any human, but definitely any man, to be able to have a mission or a purpose that uh, that I was working towards and to have that purpose have real consequences. Going into Russia, I was faced with the potential consequences of, you know, losing my freedom, being arrested and and had as a political prisoner, maybe even losing my life or something along those lines. And so for me it was it was really beautiful to get to face that and then to say I will do what I am meant to do either way and and this is this is part of my journey. And that, that initial experience for me became kind of the guiding force of, of the, of the TV show, because we spent time with this 70 year old conservationist. He's seven, you know, he's, he's spent 40 years protecting the tiger and he protects the tiger in an environment where natural resource extraction is incredibly rampant and he has had Russian mafia people come to him and basically tell him he needs to stop what he's doing and he has this beautiful line that we captured which will you know be so poignant in the TV show but he says I'm not afraid of the tiger why should I be afraid of you <laughs> and, yeah right on and and then we have this Udige elder is the indigenous person there and he just watches as this tiger kills his best friends uh, his two dogs and he's 20 yards away from the tiger and the tiger snarls at him and in that moment he says you know of course I experience fear but all I could see was beauty and so there's this theme that just comes up around like what do we do in the face of fear and i think it's incredibly entertaining as a show but also yeah just so poignant with with the topic of fear which is such a human experience and you know it'll it'll be i'll get that edit here in a, a couple of weeks and and then we'll go from there but I, yeah i'm really excited to to see where the TV show goes and where it ends up actually being housed. Um, any uh, other episodes you're working on? Or are you working on this one first as like a pilot? Yeah, that is the pilot. Uh, but I am working on another episode. In fact, in a month from now, I will be headed to Peru, and we will be. I will be going to Chavin, which is Chavin is an ancient culture in in Peru in the Peruvian highlands, and Chavin is the Quechua word for center, the center place of of civilization in uh, in Peru, and it was founded by people from the Amazonian jungle, and so they in the Chavin culture they have all these depictions of the jaguar and the jaguar was their god and so i will be going there with a uh, a beautiful artist and a wachumero so he will be serving me wachuma and i will be bringing in that spiritual practice of the indigenous people there wachuma as a, a way of connecting to the jaguar and then i'll spend a week Tell and a half that is. yeah wachuma is a it's an entheogen or a psychedelic, which is uh, based in it, it. Mescaline is the active ingredient and uh, creates, you know, vision states and uh, ways of, you know, according to indigenous people, connect connecting with spirits. And so, my intention is use the wachuma, tell the story of this plant wachuma, but connect with the jaguar, and then we will spend a week and a half in the jungle looking for the jaguar oh wow so you're going to be in the highlands but then going down into the jungle as well yes descending into the low the low world lower world yeah. to meet the jungle the jaguar having you know spent some time in cusco and uh, i've done several trips from cusco down into the jungle and what a different world you know the highlands versus the lowlands there and um and the wachuma or a lot of folks call it san pedro right they'll know it is that that sort of barrel cactus that uh that columnar cactus, I should say. Um, yeah, which I think is more from the highlands. And then that's cool, the jaguar from the lowlands. That's going to be really cool, man. I'm looking forward to that. And you're actually going to go uh, with hopes of finding jaguars there? Yeah, I am 
so <laughs> so interested in big cats and seem to have very little fear of of uh, of these animals. So we're gonna go with some trackers, and we're gonna find we're gonna find the jaguar, and hopefully we're gonna find it doing some awesome stuff like hunting for caiman and um. Mm-hmm. But but you know, it was you know back to Russia briefly. I met. You know, I never know what's going to happen on the trip. My intention is to meet the jaguar in Russia. My intention was to see a Siberian tiger. What I found was this wise elder Alexander who names the tigers that he meets and sees. And so I met one of his tigers named Joltaboka, and that tiger you know, in a spiritual way, spoke to me and taught me. And that is really what I'm seeking is to be so moved in my physical body by nature through, you know, such an awesome animal that I have insights about myself and my work and my duty on, on the earth. And I know it gets a little bit esoteric, but that brings it back to my animist beliefs. Yeah, I've, I mean, I think there's room in the world to be a little esoteric these days. It's like we've, you know, it, the 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 rationality that we've developed is so valuable, but it needs to be balanced by the esoteric in my mind, or or we get out of balance like we are now, just like we were out of balance during the Inquisition when it was just everything was esoteric and you couldn't apply scientific thinking and. You know, it's like it's like you got two brain hemispheres for two perspectives. I want one that's esoteric, and I want one that's rational. I like I like that balance personally. Um, so I think that's really cool. And man, that interest in cats is fascinating. I'm 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 always thinking about cats because they are. You know, like when you domesticate a cat, it's like, do you really domesticate a cat though, or is it still like just a killing machine? <laughs> you know, because they don't. They're not like dogs. They don't change really in their nature you know it's a it's wild i mean you know tigers like really do eat people and jaguars like haven't spent time in the jungle like they really do take people it's that's just fascinating to me you know you don't hear a lot of like about wolves eating people or coyotes eating people but you sure do hear about big cats eating people it's just amazing they're just they're fascinating and such powerful animals and when you you know when i talk to um like uh, paleo anthropologists, they they often talk about how, or you'll read it in the writings, like that that big cats were one of the big problems for human beings, and when we were coming up, <laughs> they definitely ate us a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, there's some amazing studies that I've read about about cats, and uh, just quickly, there was a there was one where this this anthropologist, like you said, he spent time in. Uh, studying baboons in Africa and he went into a cave where baboons stayed and he waited until the cover of darkness and the baboons they came into the cave and then the baboons realized that he was there and they were crazed and yelling and screaming and screeching in the cave but they wouldn't leave the cave and his research suggested that they would not leave the cave because outside the cave was lions and they there was there's such a connection between primates and cats that you know even our desire for dwellings houses and 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 safe structures is so heavily related to mm-hmm. our desire for safety from cats yeah. <laughs> the other day, Grant, who you know, our producer, was showing me this Instagram page of a girl who's raising up. I mean, she's she's one of these like uh, folks who's just you know huge following on Instagram um, because of her pets. So she's got like a Rottweiler, and so, I don't know what this cat is, but it's the same size as the Rottweiler, roughly. Uh, it's like a small black panther, I guess, or something. I don't know what it is. But anyway, watching the two of them interact is, I think, why, you know, so many folks go to her page. So she'll just, you know, video the the dog and cat interacting as playmates. And you see the cat do things that you're like, okay, the cat is just clearly physically superior to a dog. A dog is meant to be in a pack, you know, so their their power comes from their group dynamic. But the cat's like so such a soloist and 
you know, I was watching one video she had in slow motion where this cat just, cause what it's always doing is hunting the dog. And so, you know, watching it like leap out of nowhere, you know, 10 feet and land on the tree and then kick off the tree, do a 180 and hit the dog, you know, where you're like, the dog could just never do that. And the dog's always getting blindsided by this cat. But it's funny to watch the two of them side by side. And you just realize like, you know, cats just have their own agenda. And I, anybody who has house cats knows that <laughs> occasionally you meet one that's real gentle, but most of them have a bit of a wily side. Yeah, I have to say my 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 big cat obsession and I am I am genuinely obsessed with with cats and big cats, but it definitely came from my two beautiful house cats. <laughs> They're just scaled down versions, man. Yeah, I've got a jaguar tooth that I won in an archery contest <laughs> down in the jungle uh that had come from a cat that was, you know, picking off, you know, people and animals in their village and uh they eventually killed it, but you know, it's like a real thing. Uh, it's fascinating to me. Uh, anyway, man, I'm really excited for your project. Um, you know, can't wait to see where it goes. And you mentioned before your book, you know, you sent me, um, I'm assuming you're talking about the book. You sent me a manuscript a while back to, to read and I uh, really yes. enjoyed it. So where's that at? And is that something people can see yet? Yeah. If people want to go pick that up, it's just sacredhuntingbook.com. And there's a really beautiful, uh, uh, theme or a uh, way of relating to these kinds of things from Charles Eisenstein called living in the gift. And so basically it's, you know, give what you want uh, for the book. So whatever oh, wow. people feel, feel like um, gifting in return, uh, I want to make it available for anyone to read. Yeah. I found the book a, re- a really valuable read. So um, I'll just give it that little plug. Uh, what's on the horizon, man? Do you have, are you going to be pretty full-time working on the show? Or are you still, you know, how many of your events are you leading? Is there spaces for folks and how do people get involved? Yeah. So I have, I have, uh, you know, definitely the, the experiences will, will have to uh, slow down a little bit if I do end up getting the show picked up, which I think is likely to happen but yeah people can join experiences you know i have intermediate experiences in hawaii i've got experiences in the fall that are in austin texas i have co-ed experiences and they're all relatively small groups so pretty intimate and um I'll be having, yeah, right now I'm, I'm, I'm booking mostly for the fall. So people have plenty of time to get ready, but if they have any desire to, to check it out. It's just sacredhunting.com. And next year I will be, you know, likely having a few, uh, a few fewer experiences if, if I'm doing the TV show, but, uh, they'll, they'll be all the better for their rarity. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. I often feel because I, when I read those ads for you, I, I say, uh, you know, sp- spots are limited and I feel like I'm doing the scarcity thing, but it's like, no, they're actually limited because, you know, because people love to say things like that, but it's like, no, you can only bring so many people out. I really felt, uh, you know, the challenge of that the other day, just bringing my wife out, you know, and, and for me, I've gotten so used to hunting now with camera crew, with a camera crew that, um, man, it's like, it's funny. Sometimes I just miss like the ease of just going out hunting, you know, uh, it's not that easy anymore for me, but, but, uh, you know, bringing a group of people out onto the landscape, it's a whole different deal. So I can imagine you've got to keep the groups pretty small and intimate. And then when you layer in, you know, the medicine work and you layer in the ceremony and you, and I imagine there's a lot of, um, you know, just conversationally, a, a lot of debriefing time and, you know, people working through things. So, you know, I imagine you got to keep the groups pretty small. So, yeah, if you're interested in doing that, get in touch now. <laughs> it's probably going pretty fast. Monsel, it's been great to talk to you, man. I can't wait to see where your projects go. Thanks for coming on again today. Yeah, Daniel, thank you so much for having me and asking great questions. And I look forward to being another voice alongside yours uh, to retell the hunting story. I'm excited to see where you land, dude, because there's a lot of new networks now or a lot of a lot of new spaces and uh, I'm, I think that um, some of the content that I'm doing might keep me from some of those places that your uh, approach uh, might 
might open doors that I, I haven't been able to open yet. So uh, yeah, I'm excited to have you in the space and I'm excited that you're going to make space for others too. So good on you, man. Any uh, closing or last thoughts you want to leave people with? No, uh, my, my, I guess a, a line that resonates at this current moment is let everything you do be an expression of God. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.